Uh, our, um, our today's speaker is uh, Professor Michał Matuszewski from Polish Academy of Sciences, from the Institute of Physics at Polish Academy of Sciences. Mm, we are very honored to, to host him. <coughs> Uh, he graduated from uh, University of Warsaw, at the Faculty of Physics, and he made a PhD uh, at our faculty, uh, and his uh, supervisor was um, Professor Marek Trippenbach. Uh, then Michał um, went uh, for a postdoc internship to Australia, to university in uh, Canberra. And uh, when he came back to Poland, um, he uh, started working at uh, Polish Academy of Sciences, uh, where he uh, works up to now. And um, anyway, he continues collaboration uh, with our faculty, mainly with a group of uh, uh, Professor Bada Piętka and Jacek Szczytko. Mm, and uh, as you mentioned that in the last year, uh, he became a full professor. Uh, so president of Poland granted him a professor title. So we will have the pleasure to listen to young and talented professor. And uh, generally the, the subject of, of the lecture uh, touches upon the very, let's say, very modern uh, subject in, in, in science. So generally the, the physical systems used for the computation, that uh, not the whole computation is, is performed by the processor of the computer, but part of, of the computation is, is performed by a physical system. Uh, and uh, in our case, of today's lecture, this computation is performed with generally light or with, with the light interacting with the semiconductor. Um, so um, maybe this is enough just for the introduction. Uh, Michał, floor is yours. And uh, let, let me switch the, the screen and uh, you, will, uh, you will be able to uh, switch on your slides. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, so I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm thank you for the invitation to uh, uh, speak. I'm very honored to to be able to speak in this uh, conversatorium. Uh, so uh, mm, mm, I will speak today about uh, efficient optical computing with X in, pol in polaritons. Uh, but uh, first of all, uh, I will uh, I want to acknowledge my collaborators. So uh, especially uh, Andrzej Opala, who uh, recently graduated as my uh, um, PhD student. And uh, collaboration with the experimental groups, um, uh, with the group uh, from uh, the University of Warsaw, uh, from Faculty of Physics of Barbara Piętka and Jacek Szczytko and also the group of uh, Dario Ballarini and Daniel Sandita from uh, CNR in Lecce. Uh, also, we collaborated with the group of Timo Tidio from uh, Nanyang Technological University of Singapore. So my, my talk uh, will be connected with uh, neural networks and machine learning. So first, I would like to uh, give a short introduction to the topic of neural networks. So uh, what is machine learning? Mm, well, uh, we know that uh, mm, computers are extremely efficient in solving many problems. However, there is a class of problems that is very difficult to solve using standard algorithms. So step-by-step -step algorithms uh, written by a programmer. Uh, for example, it is very difficult to uh, write an algorithm that would recognize an object in different, from different viewpoints in different scenarios. For example, uh, a program that would recognize an, uh, a cut in a, in a photo. Uh, uh, another example is to detection of fraudulent credit card transaction. There are many such problems and uh, what is common uh, in them is that this kind of problems need, uh, need to combine a very large number of weak rules 
with complex dependencies rather than follow simple rules. So, for example, we cannot just uh, read uh, the intensity or color of uh, certain pixels and uh, then uh, try to um, sim simply write an algorithm that would uh, try to find out if there is a certain object in the in a image. On the other hand, this, uh, these tasks are often relatively easy for humans. So none of us would have any problem telling that there is a cut in each of those photos. So uh, recently, there's been a lot of progress in artificial neural networks. And these are actually, uh, mm, this is type of machine learning, which is very successful in recent years, especially with the introduction of deep learning. And here, instead of writing an algorithm uh, which performs the task, uh, you write an algorithm which uh, tries to learn on its own. So uh, typically, there is a training phase when this neural network is trained to perform the task, and the inference phase when this task is, uh, is uh, carried out. And uh, the simplest neural network um, uh, is composed is the so-called feedforward neural network that is composed of uh, a number of layers. In, and in each of this layer, a transformation uh, is performed. So in uh, input, uh, input layer is simply um, a layer where the information arrives. So for example, this can be information such as intensity of, of uh, um, uh, in the pixels of, of an image. There is a number of hidden layers uh, composed of neurons where each of the neurons is performing certain uh, operation and typically this operation is the following uh, this neuron in the hidden layer is uh, gathering information from uh, the neurons in the previous layer and multiplying them by certain weights so with each connection is associated with a certain weight then a uh, certain uh, nonlinear transformation uh, called activation function is applied to this result of the summation and the result of this uh, this operation is uh, treated as an input for the next layer uh, finally the information uh, arrives to the output units and the uh, goal of training is to uh, adjust the weights in uh, of these connections all the weights of the connection in such a way in such a way that in the um, let's selected output units that corresponds to a certain class, for example, such as a cat, that this uh, neuron is activated when uh, there is a cat in, uh, in this input. And how it is it done? Uh, there is a certain algorithm that amends, uh, um, that changes the weights in each of this uh, connection between layers to minimize the error rate for expected error rate for uh, the task that we are want to perform. Once this uh, neural network is trained, it can then uh, perform this task as many times as uh, we want. And this is called the inference phase. What is important that this kind of networks can realize this task on samples that uh, it has never seen before. So samples that have, if we have a, a cat that was never present in the training uh, data set, that was used for training, it can still be recognized by this network. So uh, the application of machine learning are very uh, wide actually already. For example, in the case of autonomous cars, uh, we of course we need to recognize uh, objects, we need to uh, make some decisions and this, this is realized actually by, by machine learning or artificial intelligence. Uh, for example, whenever we uh, speak to our phone, we want to uh, perform some speech recognition. This is also, this information is actually sent to some kind of neural network over the, over the internet, which uh, performs this task. Uh, as I mentioned, it can be used in fraud prevention, but also in medical diagnosis. And uh, recently there has been some um, news saying that uh, machine learning can perform certain recognition of certain diseases in, uh, in medical images better than any uh, humans. 
Uh, and finally, uh, whenever we use a Google search engine, there is actually a machine learning algorithm that is processing the the type of query that we uh, give to the uh, to the search engine. Uh, so uh, when we machine learning is also very useful in uh, analysis of uh, language uh, language translation and language analysis. So this is all very uh, nice and interesting. But in this talk, I wanted to um, emphasize some limitation of machine learning, uh, namely. Uh, existing machine learning algorithms are uh, really uh, resource consuming. So if we want to um, uh, process a large amount of data, and this is usual, usually the case when we are using machine learning, this, uh, um, this requires a lot of energy. For example, if you uh, want to train uh, this BERT model, which is used currently in the Google search engine, this requires about 5,000 hours of training on a GPU. Uh, this is more or less, uh, this is similar uh, amount to a single passenger trip from New York to San Francisco. So it, it is a pretty uh, significant amount of uh, energy and carbon footprint. And uh, if we look at the prognosis of what will happen in the next years, this is actually not very optimistic because depending on the particular scenario, optimistic or pessimistic that we consider, even up to 50% of electricity will be used by information and communication technology uh, globally, so by, the, by 2030. So this is really a significant amount of energy, and uh, most of it uh, comes from uh, big data applications. And there is a physical reason for it. Uh, so if we look at uh, how uh, computer chips have been developing over the last decades, for many, many years, we observed um, dramatic increase of efficiency of uh, electronic chips because uh, of certain scaling laws. However, at some point, the, scaling, uh, have, uh, the scaling uh, dropped. So if, for example, if you look at the speed of computation, clock speed of computation, about around 2000, there uh, is a saturation of uh, speed, which is due to uh, inefficiency of communication and uh, increase of heating. And this uh, comes from the breakdown of uh, so-called Denard scaling, which states that as the density of transistors per millimeter squared increases, the power consumption of uh, transistor per transistor decreases proportionally. So the power of per certain surface, such a millimeter square, is constant. And this uh, scaling law is due to uh, some kind of uh, unit analysis. However, it is, can be derived under certain assumptions. So when we go to very small system with very small transistors, it no longer is uh, true because new physical processes and new uh, um, channels of energy dissipation become important. So at some point around 2006, this scaling law uh, ceased to be true. And by 2012, it practically dropped to zero. So it means that even though we are uh, technologically able to make smaller and smaller transistors, these chips produce more and more energy uh, every year. So uh, what is the answer to this problem? One of the possible uh, avenues is neuromorphic computing. Uh, and what is neuromorphic computing? Well, this is an approach to realize neural network that is different from simulations of neural networks that we are using uh, practically on all applications uh, uh, currently. So whenever we are using uh, processing some data uh, for machine learning using neural network, uh, we have some kind of simulation in a computer. This is only virtually existing in computer memory. However, if we manage to somehow uh, map the structure of the neural network physically in a physical system, this can lead to significant improvement of efficiency. Uh, why is that? Because uh, modern computers are based on uh, von Neumann architecture. 
In the Bonniemann architecture, we have separate processing units, such as CPU or GPU, and separate memory unit. Of course, there can be many such units. However, the point is that these units are connected by a bus, which is, in the case of big data applications that require a lot of data to be transferred between CPU and memory, a significant bottleneck that is called a von Neumann bottleneck. So how to uh, avoid this problem? Uh, well, there are uh, many attempts to uh, avoid this. And one of the first prototypes for such neuromorphic systems was uh, the True North chip from IBM, uh, which consisted of, uh, of about 1 million neurons, 200 million synapses, and had a very uh, high efficiency. So its power consumption was already 100 lower than for in, a, in a CPU. Uh, and the architecture of this, uh, of this chip was the following. Instead of separate processing and memory units, uh, there are blocks of neurons with synapses and communication units. So basically, neurons are units which perform processing. Synapses are the weights of, of neural network. So these are memory units. So we have processing units and memory units that are connected uh, to them very close, physically very close to each other. So this uh, makes the communication bottleneck much, uh, much less important. And we have, of course, some communication. We need to have some communication between neurons that are far apart. But this communication is um, relatively um, less, uh, um, there is relatively less data with that we have to uh, um, send between distant neurons. And this uh, allows to achieve uh, higher efficiency. So there are many other systems that are developed in companies uh, as well as in, uh, in academia. Uh, there are um, big projects such as Human Brain Project or the Brain Initiative that also included development of uh, neuromorphic systems. However, these were all electronic systems. And in this talk, I would like to uh, consider optical systems for this kind of information processing. Uh, why photons? Well, uh, we know that electrons, uh, electronic systems are excellent for information processing. Uh, they are characterized by substantial interactions, which makes it possible to perform any kind of operations practically. However, as I uh, mentioned uh, before, this in the case of big data application, this is uh, also accompanied with high losses. The other hand, photons are excellent for uh, we know that we use optic fiber for sending information over large distances at high data rates. This is much more much more efficient than using uh, just electric cables. However, the problem is that photons are interacting very weakly and only in nonlinear media. On the other hand, we can have very low losses at high data rates. Use optical, uh, optics to, for example, beat a neural network. Well, this is not a new idea. This is actually an idea that appeared uh, for the first time uh, as, uh, uh, in the 70s. So very, uh, mm, it's a long time ago. And the idea is uh, the following, that if we look at Maxwell equations, these Maxwell equations, if, let's say, uh, we have certain configuration of a physical system. This Maxwell configuration can be mapped to a vector matrix multiplication operation. And this vector matrix uh, multiplication is actually a core of many, uh, many important tasks, uh, including uh, operation of neural network, because in neural network, we need to uh, multiply uh, weights of neural network by inputs. So this is basically this kind of operation but also in other operations such as Fourier transforms and so on. So the point here is that we need to, um, if we have uh, a number of optical sources, so this can be, for example, an array of uh, semiconductor lasers, we have a certain set of lenses that is uh, that are put in a special way. 
We have a memory mask in between, which corresponds to this matrix that we want to multiply this vector by. Then uh, this in the output plane, the intensity of light will be simply uh, the intensity of, uh, of the input vector times the, um, the times the memory mask elements. So this is a simple idea, and it uh, was implemented in many experiments. It was even uh, later generalized to using holograms instead of memory mask, which allows one to uh, obtain much higher density of information encoded. Uh, however, the problem is that this idea was never uh, really commercialized or applied in practice. So, um, why is what, what was the reason? There were several reasons for that. One of the reasons was that the um, electronics was developing very fast, according to Morse law. Electronics were universal, so we could uh, implement any kind of operation with electronics. However, with optics, only specific applications were specific uh, operations were possible. Uh, optics were quite unpractical because elements such as lenses are pretty bulky. On the other hand, electronics became more and more integrated. And finally, apart from uh, communication, the practical advantage of photonics in terms of speed or energy efficiency has never been demonstrated. However, I want to uh, point out that now uh, things are uh, getting a little bit different. So as I mentioned before, uh, Moore's law is no longer valid. There is a growing need for application-specific devices, even in electronics. So for example, uh, elements such as GPUs and TPUs, they perform on only specific operations. Uh, photonics can be now integrated on a chip, and I, I will show some examples in the next slides. And the advantage of photonics is likely to be demonstrated in the near future. So uh, how can uh, optics be integrated? Well, one of the examples is uh, shown here. This is uh, one of the first um, realizations of optical neurons, which was realized using uh, integrated um, wave cuts in silicon. So here we can see uh, wave cuts, which are the, the, these faint uh, black lines, where the light is directed. The, this um, this uh, uh, um, like yellow uh, lines are electrical uh, contacts, actually, which are um, which are manipulating light. So the idea here is that we have input which is composed of uh, light, including many frequencies. So each frequency corresponds to a certain input to a neuron. We have a certain set of ring resonators that selectively transfer part of this light in the input waveguide to the out to the to this upper waveguide. And then we have and actually there are two sets of such uh, such uh, ring resonators. And then we direct this light to a balanced photodetector which basically measures the difference between intensity of light, which is incident on this photodiode and this photodiode. So we can have both positive and negative weights of the neuron. Transferred uh, to an electrical signal and used as an input for a laser, which produces this nonlinear activation function. And the output from the neuron is uh, is uh, correspond to the output of the of the uh, laser. So this is a, a nice demonstration how we can in integrate uh, photonic photonic uh, to realize neurons. However, this uh, idea uh, has not been scaled so far to very large uh, arrays. Another idea, which is um, probably more scalable, is Again, based on this uh, simple idea that we can map Maxwell equation to certain operations such as vector matrix multiplication. But here, instead of a single uh, operation, we have a number of layers. So here, uh, coherent light is incident on the input plane and goes through certain masks, which are letting uh, part of the light to pass 
they can also imprint some kind of optical phase. And the operation of, uh, of light propagating between the layers is analogous to uh, multiplication of input by certain uh, weights. So we can simulate in this way uh, neural networks, however, without nonlinearity. So this is the disadvantage of this setup that there it is difficult to implement activation nonlinear activation functions here. However, uh, the system was successfully uh, used for for uh, tasks such as image recognition. So so uh, here a hundred and digit was presented at the input, and at the output as a corresponding detector corresponding to the class, uh, for example, such as a number five was activated if this digit was presented at the input. So another uh, interesting uh, method of using optics for neural networks is based on a system of, of max vendor interferometers forming an optical interference unit. So here, the idea is based on the fact that whenever we have a um, linear operation, we can divide this linear operation into two unitary operations, V and U, and one diagonal operation, which uh, corresponds only to the attenuation of signal. And both the unitary operations and the diagonal operation can be implemented optically using Max Zender interferometers if we have coherent light. So without going into details, this was implemented on an optical chip presented here. And it was used for um, uh, vowel, spoken vowel recognition with quite uh, high accuracy. This was the first demonstration in 2017. And actually, nowadays, there are two startups which, uh, which uh, quite good funding, which are developing this idea for a practical implementation. OK, so now uh, I would like to move to uh, polariton neural networks. So why do we need polaritons here? Uh, well, I mentioned to you before that the disadvantage of photons is that they interact weakly. So it is difficult to implement a nonlinear uh, activation function. If the interact interaction is weak, then it means that the nonlinearity is weak. So we need actually to use a lot of light. Uh, the intensity of light has to be very high to, um, to get a nonlinear response. So the question is, can we have both the advantage of electrons and photons in the same system? So can we have substantial interactions and low communication losses at the same time? And actually, there is a system which has both of these good uh, properties in a single particle. And this is uh, exactly exciton polaritons. Because exciton polaritons are uh, quantum eigenstates of excitons, so electron pole pairs, uh, quasi atoms, existing in a semiconductor. So uh, exciton can be considered as a kind of hydrogen atom with an electron and hole playing the role of electron and, and uh, nucleus in a in a hydrogen atom. And these excitons, they are trapped in, typically trapped in a quantum well. And if we put this quantum well in, in between two uh, very high reflectivity mirrors that create a cavity for photons, then this light and excitons become, um, become strongly coupled. And if this coupling is so sufficiently strong to overcome the coherence in the system, then uh, it means that our quantum uh, quantum excitations will be uh, not photons and electrons, but mixed hybrid par particles that are called exciton polarizations. And these particles have properties of both matter and light. So they have very strong interactions, and they have, uh, for example, low, uh, very uh, good transport properties and low losses when uh, during transport. And what is important that the strength of interparticle excitons, thanks to this exciton component, corresponds to the world record of ultra-fast optical nonlinearity. 
Uh, if uh, for a theoretical description of these particles, the simplest uh, Hamiltonian looks like this. So we have uh, exciton in, uh, excitations, which are more or less uh, bosonic. Uh, we have photons, which are also bosonic. And we have interaction bit, uh, of photons and excitons. So we, we see that we can create an exciton by annihilating the photon and vice versa. And uh, if we look at the solutions at the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian, then, uh, well, uh, the, the excitations without this coupling, without omega, correspond to bare photons and excitons. So exciton polaritons are uh, mixed uh, particles of light and matter. So exciton polaritons were um, actually applied in many um, kinds of uh, experiments including uh, logic elements such as gates, switches, routers, transistors. They were used for simulations of systems such as XY Hamiltonian, uh, Hawking radiation, uh, phase transitions, and also for uh, devices such as lasers, uh, detectors, and topological lasers. And we propose that they can also be used for neural networks, and they have certain advantages in, in this respect. Okay, so maybe I will skip this. So uh, nowadays there are already many experimental de demonstrations of switches, transistors, and so on. And there, the efficiencies, if we use exciton polaritons, efficiencies are quite high. They uh, are approaching femto or etojoule energy scale. However, the problem is that we don't have efficient memory units where we could store information and retrieve it. Uh, spending, let's say, attojoule or femtojoule energy. And this element is necessary component for the operation of a conventional digital device. And uh, to somehow avoid these problems, we can instead de design a neural network without external memory, where the information would be processed on the fly. So we, don't, we would not have uh, the necessity to store the information during uh, information processing. And we uh, came up with an idea how can, it can be done based on the so-called reservoir computing. So reservoir computing is a, a pretty nice idea developed uh, in the early uh, 2000, uh, which um, is a kind of neural network, but with a very strange, um, let's say, architecture. So in reservoir computing, we don't have uh, such layer structure as I showed you before. Instead, we, we have basically just three, three layers. We have input layer, which provides information, which always has to be present. We have output layer that is collecting information. And we have uh, one just one layer composed of nodes, which are uh, usually rad randomly connected. And they are completely static. So, with, uh, during training of the network, we are not changing any connections in this reservoir layer. So it is pretty static and it looks like it doesn't perform any anything, one could say. However, uh, what is important is that the nodes in this layer are nonlinear. So actually, what is happening, uh, this reservoir is transforming the information from the input layer in a very nonlinear way transforming it to a very high dimensional space because the dimension of the space is the number of uh, is equal to the number of these nodes and the number of nodes in this reservoir is usually very high uh, so actually then in the output layer is the layer where uh, teaching is performed so when we are teaching the network we are only changing the weights in the output in the output layer and this output layer can extract this information from this reservoir in such a way that is that makes it easier to perform the task that we want to perform. So uh, it seems like a um, silly idea, but it actually works very well. So uh, there were many uh, examples where reservoir computing was used to per for performing complicated tasks, and it actually helped a lot. So one of the uh, examples actually uh, in optical uh, domain was uh, recognition of uh, 
human actions. So there were videos with frames showing certain actions of humans. And the uh, goal was to recognize to which class of action it, the video belongs. And the realization was used an uh, optical system that was had a circular architecture, and the information was basically flowing in a circle, and there was some interactions between, between uh, pulses, optical pulses, uh, which were uh, nearby. And this is a kind of reservoir. It's a very simple reservoir because it has a circular structure, but it's still allowed to process the information quite efficiently. So our idea was to use polaritons to uh, perform a certain task with very high efficiency. And the idea is the following. Uh, this uh, this uh, image from the microscope presents a lattice, polariton lattice. So there is a, this is actually a hexagonal lattice of polariton nodes. So each node is a pillar of a semiconductor and each pillar consists actually of uh, two black mirrors here and here, and a quantum well in between. It is not, of course, not visible, but this is actually a micro cavity with a quantum well inside. So each of these uh, pillars that are kind of glued together, they can host polaritons. And because they are in contact, polaritons also can hop between neighboring pillars. And the uh, theoretical description that quite well described this kind of system is based on discrete complex ginzburg landau equation that in the simplest form looks like this. And it uh, includes not only coupling between these uh, pillars, but also losses, uh, pumping, nonlinear losses, and interactions that are important for us. And our idea was to uh, inject the information to this, to this lattice. Uh, in the form of time-dependent pulses. So if we have, uh, we want, we consider the, the task of 110 digit recognition. So for example, this is 110 digit zero. So the information in these digits was uh, transformed into time-dependent pulses. Then it was multiplied by a, center ran a certain random matrix, which was random, but it was fixed during the experiments. Uh, and it was injected into certain pillars. So the goal of this matrix was to uh, sort of distribute this information over the whole lattice. The system was also pumped, uh, pumped from, by non-resonant pump uh, to, to maintain close to, to some kind of stability threshold. And then uh, the dynamics of the system was monitored and recorded, and the intensity of light um, in each of these pillars was used for performing the classification in the last stage. And in this way, we uh, implemented the reservoir that was performing 110 digit recognition from the NIST dataset, which is some kind of very well known dataset we use for benchmarking of neural networks. And we obtained accuracy up to 95% for large lattices, which is a quite good uh, result. Um, so um, we found out that this uh, network works the best when we are close to uh, some kind of, um, uh, to the threshold of condensation. So because polaritons are bosons, then they can undergo uh, bosonic condensation, which is analog to Bose-Einstein condensation. And this is um, this phase transition threshold is where the um, system works the best because there's a point of a transition from one state to another. And the system becomes very sensitive to the information that is provided. So it can uh, perform a very nonlinear uh, transformation of data. Uh, and what is important, we, we estimated, of course, this is only a theoretical estimate, but uh, from our estimates, we can tell that this system should be efficient because if we look at the speed of uh, recognition, for example, for spoken uh, digits, uh, in principle, uh, the system should um, be able to perform it orders of magnitude better than in other uh, physically realized systems. So now I would like to move to experiments.
So the first experiment that was more or less based on the idea, but uh, with some changes, was uh, done in the group of uh, Dario Ballarini and Daniel Sanvito in uh, Lecce. And the idea here was not to transform the data to time-dependent signals, as I, I showed before, but it turned out that from the experimental point of view, it is easier to encode it completely spatially. So uh, this information was uh, encoded in a spatial light modulator. Uh, this uh, light beam was then uh, directed on a polariton sample, and the, um, the, this polariton sample was performing a nonlinear transformation of the data. So here is the dependence of, on the basically the input to the sample and the output. So we see that this uh, the response is in fact very nonlinear. Uh, and finally, this um, the result was recorded on a CCD camera. So uh, the intensity of each node was recorded and multiplied by the matrix of weight weights to determine the class uh, to which this digit corresponds to. So uh, we found that uh, the efficiency of the system it was quite high. It was about, about 93% uh, for the diminished uh, data set, uh, which is uh, um, higher than other in other experimental implementations uh, previously. But what also what is important, it is higher, significantly higher than the limit of linear classification, uh, which uh, corresponds basically to the case where we don't have this reservoir, we don't have this nonlinear uh, transformation. So we can imagine that uh, we can uh, perform the same task without this reservoir. So injecting input directly to the output, and then we still can uh, have some accuracy uh, if we choose the weights appropriate, uh, in an appropriate way. But we, we show that uh, our system performs better. So it means that this reservoir is actually working. It performs some useful transformation. Uh, moreover, we can, um, well, we have high accuracy, but in principle, the system can be also very uh, fast. So because this is a um, polariton system, in which uh, typical time spans are on the picosecond, uh, in the picosecond range, in principle, it can perform information processing in terahertz uh, frequencies. Of course, in our system, the speed was not so high because we used a spatial light modulator, which is a liquid crystal device, and the, the rate of refreshing uh, was uh, much, much lower. However, the spatial light modulator can be replaced with a more uh, uh, advanced, uh, faster device. And the, the polariton device itself, it, it doesn't have its limitation. So uh, another experiment was uh, um, performed actually with the collaboration uh, in the group of uh, um, Professor Barbara Pientka and Professor Jacek Szczytko. And it was uh, based on uh, um, the concept of binarized neural networks. So this concept of binarized neural network is a, a very interesting uh, concept. Uh, which is based on the fact that if we used instead of neural networks, if we used instead of uh, continuous variables, we use uh, discrete variables zero and one. In certain cases, we can uh, have still very high accuracy of predictions, but on the other hand, we um, have much lower, uh, much lower energy uh, loss and much higher efficiency. So this is an idea from the machine learning community discovered uh, by in parallel by several groups and uh, we found that this can be also useful for the implementation in optical system because it is basically easier to uh, implement a binary neuron than than a continuous one uh, with a certain uh, well described um, activation function so uh, in a binarized network, the base, base, basic validating block is a neuron which is performing exclusive OR operation. Why exclusive OR operation? Because this operation is uh, nonlinear, highly nonlinear. And this can be seen uh, on such a simple example. If we want to uh, perform this exclusive OR operation, we cannot uh, use just a linear class simple linear classification. 
because uh, we have one type of answer, answer zero for the blue dots, and another answer for the orange dots. So if our input x is zero zero, uh, x and y is zero zero or one one, we have uh, result uh, zero, and for zero one or one zero, we have answer one. And we plot it in in param in the input space. We cannot draw a straight line, which corresponds to linear classification, which would distinguish the two, two cases. It is impossible. At the, the best case, we get 75% accuracy, and this dot will not be uh, give us the correctness. However, we can uh, get 100% accuracy if we introduce another uh, another um, feature. So another. Uh, um, another variable to our uh, to our uh, system, which is a nonlinear transformation of these two inputs. So if we have this additional feature, which is represented by the z-axis, then it, then and if it is sufficiently nonlinear, then we may be able to uh, draw a, a certain hyperplane that would div uh, divide the cases uh, of uh, result uh, zero and result one. So uh, we experimentally, uh, a finalized neuron was constructed using a polariton microcavity. And uh, a network was then performed. It was constructed in, in software, basically, by time multiplexing of this neuron uh, based on the concept of our extreme learning machine. Uh, in the concept of extreme learning machine, basically, again, we only train this uh, output layer of the network, and we leave this input layer uh, untrained. Uh, but here uh, I want to emphasize that uh, what was realized in software was only linear um, operations, whereas nonlinear transformation was realized entirely with optical elements. So it means that what is usually the most difficult part, so applying nonlinearity in the optical domain, was here realized completely in optical domain. And uh, this was possible because the response of the system to uh, input light was highly nonlinear at the threshold of condensation. So here we can see that the dependence of uh, output photoluminescence in, in function of input energy was uh, nonlinear and it actually uh, resembled a uh, real function that is known in the neural network community as a uh, quite a good uh, activation function for neurons. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, time multiplexing was uh, used to realize this complete ne network which uh, consisted of, of uh, thousands of uh, gates. Uh, and this network um, outperformed, again, outperformed linear uh, classification by a large mass margin, and the achieved accuracy of 96% is actually similar as in state of the art uh, other hardware approach uh, realizations. So, uh, okay, so this was implementation which included optics for nonlinearity and also uh, software for performing this linear uh, classification. But we also wanted to see whether it's possible to realize a completely all optical gate where both the linear part and nonlinear part is performed optically. And to realize this, to realize this all optical uh, gate, uh, additional light paths were introduced, which were then mixed with the output from the, from the microcavity containing polaritons. And these optical weights were tuned in such a way to uh, effectively create this uh, hyperplane that will distinguish this, uh, this uh, cases zero and one. And in the result, we obtained a very, very uh, actually quite accurate uh, gate which will, could uh, perform this task. And uh, what is also important that the optical energy that has had to be used to perform this task was on the level of 16 picojoule per synaptic operation. And this is uh, quite low uh, energy that, uh, because, uh, for example, in, in electronic devices such as GPUs, the typical cost of synaptic operation is on the level of, let's say, 100 picojoules. And so we are uh, already 
in some way better than electronics. However, of course, this is only part of the energy that was used in the system because uh, there were also electronic uh, parts, for example, for maintaining uh, cooling of uh, and um, and other uh, additional tasks. So, but it shows that there is potential for optics to outperform electronics. So, uh, finally, I wanted to uh, describe some outlook of the system and to to um, tell why we think this uh, this approach is promising for optical computing. Uh, if we look at fundamental estimates, then we can consider such a photo experiment where we have an optical cavity containing polariton excitations and we have optic an optical pulse with certain energy passing through so if we want to perform some nonlinear operation this the simplest uh, operation is just applying um, some kind of optical phase so this is this optical phase is delta phi this is the basic uh, effect of let's say uh, third order kernel, kernel linearity uh, in the microcavity. So in the first order approximation, we can say that the space shift is proportional to the energy of the pulse. And if we can achieve a pi phase shift, then it means that, for example, this is a useful for, for performing a useful operation, enough, enough for performing useful operation, because, for example, then we can take this pulse, interfere it with the copy of the input pulse, in a max inter interferometer to completely block uh, the pulse if the space becomes pi. So we can build, for example, optical gate. So if we look at the numbers, this corresponds more or less to the condition that the nonlinear energy in the in the introduced by this pulse is higher than the cavity polariton lifetime, where gamma is the loss constant. Uh, N is the average excitant density, and G is the excitant interaction constant. And we, if we put numbers here, we will find out that this energy cost is about three attojoules. And this is about four orders of magnitude lower for polaritons than for other nonlinear optical media. And this is because exactly we have here hybridization of light and matter. So what does it mean is that we can imagine um, um, we can imagine a device which performs operation with a very high efficiency. So uh, this is a proposal that we put forward where we have a complete network, neural network, with the input, uh, which is directed on, uh, on a certain uh, on a surface of uh, polariton, which contains polariton nodes. The output from this uh, from this uh, sample is then split by the beam splitter to m copies when m corresponds to the number of classes that we want to uh, distinguish. Uh, these m copies of outputs are then multiplied optically by weight banks, which can be implemented, for example, by spatial light modulators uh, or um, phase change materials. And it is then uh, directed uh, focus on detectors, and each of the detectors correspond to a certain class. So this uh, system can perform classification uh, of data uh, um, corresponding to M classes. And now uh, there are actually no electronic elements in the network, except for light modulators and the, in at the input, and detectors of the output, and this weight bank, which is also, uh, we imagine that is controlled electronically. However, it doesn't have to have high refresh rate because we, if we have a certain task, we don't have to change it every time uh, we um, have a new sample to uh, recognize. And what is important that usually there are much more weights in the neural network than inputs and in output classes. So it means that even if we have to implement a certain number of input uh, modulators, then the cost of um, energy cost of uh, applying these modulators will be divided over many, many more neurons and uh, weights in the system. So uh, we can then try to estimate the energy cost and the speed of such a system. 
And to um, take, get a realistic estimate, we took into account uh, basically all the costs. So energy cost of a light source, such as the laser, modulators, detectors, and optical losses that can be present in the system. And we consider two cases. Uh, an idealized case where, where we have large scale system, we have parameters corresponding to the best state of the art elements. And uh, case B, which is a proof of principle system with a relatively small number of nodes and uh, optical elements that basically can either be bought or which are easily accessible, such as a low quality polariton sample. And it turns out that in both cases, we can have improvement in both energy efficiency and in performance density, which are typical measures of efficiency of, uh, of uh, information processing systems in, uh, in the case of, of electronic chips. So uh, this is quite promising. And uh, this is thanks to this uh, high nonlinearity of exciton polaritons. So finally, uh, I want to uh, now um, underscore some uh, future work that we planned and some challenges for the system. So one thing that we are still lacking is the experimental demonstration of large scale network. What we had is uh, what we have is a network that had uh, up to let's say around 100 nodes, uh, physical nodes. Uh, we all still um, lack signal regeneration. If we want to perform uh, implement many layer system, then we need to have some kind of regeneration of the system after each layer. Uh, we need to uh, achieve room temperature operation for it to be practical. So far, these experiments were performed in uh, in liquid helium. However, here there are many uh, materials where pol external polaritons were actually observed and uh, implemented in at room temperature. Uh, there are many possibilities. And finally, we need some kind of efficient interface between electronics and optics at the input of the network and the output of the network. Uh, but this is actually um, not only concern of our uh, system, but of all um, optical systems that uh, uh, have this problem, because uh, the information in our world is basically available in electronic format, not in optical form except, of course, for some specific tasks, such as uh, uh, vision. So uh, finally, uh, to sum up, uh, we demonstrated theoretically and implemented experimentally uh, polar exciton polariton neural networks. And we believe that it is a potentially a powerful platform for machine learning with photons. And our uh, estimates indicate that orders of magnitude improvements over electronics in terms of speed energy efficiency may be achieved. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this uh, interesting uh, lecture and uh, providing a wide perspective. Uh, and the, the lecture is open for discussion. Are there any questions? You can you can uh, just speak up or you can raise a hand. Yes, Tihan uh, Lee, please. Uh, thank you for the nice uh, presentation. I mean, you mentioned actually no efficient uh, memory units, so uh, maybe I did not understand how to actually store. Uh, the information in, in this actually process, like you mentioned the ledger bar computing, and you also talk about the, how to avoid the actually um, uh, storing uh, memory. I mean, I, I didn't understand the, that part. So I mean, either uh, you say we don't have to. Uh, have a conventional memory you need, or you, you can store the information a certain other way? Or can you explain about that? Uh, yes, sure. So uh, mm, the point here is that mm, if we have a neuromorphic system, then we don't basically don't need external memory. So 
if we have a simulation of a neural network in our computer, then we need to store the information about the neurons, about the weights, because the processing unit is processing each node uh, uh, one after another. So it needs to retrieve the information about synaptic weights, about inputs, it has to process and then to store it and store it somewhere in the memory. But if we have a hardware system where we have uh, basically neurons implemented in hardware, then this memory can be basically um, stored locally. So we don't need any kind of external memory uh, such as in this von Neumann bottleneck. So uh, in our case, uh, if we look at this system, then basically we, we have input we have light that is propagating through the system, but it is it doesn't have to be stored uh, anywhere uh, over. It's, it's actually processed on the fly. So we have uh, sources, uh, information is going through. It is processed nonlinearly uh, during this um, during this propagation, and then it is recorded. What is recorded is the result. So it means that we don't need to store this uh, partial information, which is which is appearing on the way. Uh, during this computation, anywhere uh, during this process. Of course, then we, when when we get the result, we, we get the output. We need some kind of. We can imagine that there is some kind of uh, uh, computer or memory unit that is storing this output. But we only need to store the output. So it means that we um, can spend much much less energy because usually, uh, let's say the number of uh, the number of uh, classes at the output is can be, for example, for the handwritten digit recognition task is only 10. It's only 10 classes. So we, we basically we need to only uh, have uh, the indication in which class it is. In the, at the input, we have uh, we have image, which is, let's say, uh, 20 by 20 uh, or 30 by 30 pixels. So it's not a large number of uh, information that has to be stored. But if we are using a classical computer to perform all this operation, then we have to store all the partial information appearing during this process. So in this in this kind of uh, on the fly um, implementation, we are avoiding the cost of storing this uh, this memory temporary memory that don't, don't need to be used in the um, finally. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Are there any further questions? Maybe I would have one um, because you compared uh, different um, systems performing logical operations, and you indicated that cost of synaptic operation using polaritons is low. And would you dare to, to compare um, the cost of, in terms of energy per, per operation, uh, using when you use polaritons and? Um, uh, Cost of operation when the brain works. What is that? Uh, is it possible to assess the cost of the of the single operation in our brain? What is the cost of energy? Uh, yes, it is possible, uh, but honestly, I don't remember the exact numbers. Uh, the cost of energy of uh, processing in the brain is quite low, actually. Mm. Mm. The, the, point, lower than... the point is that for brain, the speed is also very low because the brain is working only on about 10 hertz uh, frequency. So each neuron can be activated only 10 times uh, during a second. Um, but the cost of operation is very low. But I don't remember the exact number, so I cannot uh, really uh, compare uh, I'm also not sure if it's so easy to uh, to estimate because we yes, I agree, I agree because it is a very complex system and um, yeah, and but but maybe you can comment on why brain is so efficient. Uh, yes. So that there is this scaling um, that basically the argument was that um, for electronics that. If you, if you plot the, the clock rate on one uh, on one uh, axis of the graph and and uh, and energy that has to be used on a y axis, then you have basically a linear dependence. So it means that 
the, um, the faster your um, system is, the more energy it takes, actually. So the brain is on the very low side. So it has very low frequency and very high efficiency. And this works for electronic systems, more or less all the process, generations of processors were following this trend. But here in optical systems, we have a completely different physics. So we can have high frequency and low, ener uh, low energy at the same time. So uh, we have in this graph, we have both. We have energy efficiency and we have performance density with basically number of operations per second per millimeter squared. And uh, we can actually gain on both uh, efficiency and uh, speed with op optical systems. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, uh, if not, uh, mm, let's thank the speaker uh, once again for, for this talk. Um, and uh, we are going to meet in May, mm, somehow in, in the second uh, par, uh, half of May. Uh, we will ab update you uh, soon. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for coming and, uh, and see you. Have a nice spring. <laughs>